Welcome to the McMillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkshire, host, and our guest is Edita Bojanowska. She is professor of Slavic languages and literature and chair of the European Studies Council at the McMillan Center. Professor Bojanowska studies and teaches about 19th century Russian literature and intellectual history, as well as empire and nation in Russian culture. Today, we'll talk with Professor Bojanowska about her new book, A World of Empires, The Russian Voyage of the Frigate Pallada. Welcome, Professor Bojanowska. Thank you for having me. Let's start with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. So my book is about a famous mid-19th century Russian voyage um, around Africa and Asia to open up Japan to European trade. Mm -hmm. Now, most people who have heard of this part of history think of the US Commodore Matthew Perry because he's typically credited with opening up Japan to European right. trade. But um, the Russian expedition that I write about was actually following Perry uh, very closely. And they arrived in Japan roughly three weeks, three weeks after the Americans. Mm -hmm. And they actually they both negotiated with the Japanese at roughly the same time. So uh, you might also wonder, well, what's the big deal about signing a treaty with another country? Mm -hmm. um, it so happens that in the mid 19th century, Japan, uh, the government of Japan, um, forswore any contacts with Western European powers. Mm -hmm. So this was an attempt by the American and Russian missions to force Japan to open to Western trade, to open its uh, treaty, its, its ports and its economy, uh, and to structure that trade relationship in a way that benefited Western powers. Mm -hmm. Now, before uh, the Russian expedition reached Japan, they sailed alongside the Western shores of Africa. Uh, they made a month-long stop in the Cape Colony, so today's South Africa. Uh, they crossed the Indian Ocean and made stops in the ports of Manila, Singapore, Hong Kong, Shanghai, mm -hmm. uh, and then sailed alongside the northern shores of Korea. So this was, this was really an incredible, uh, incredible voyage. Mm -hmm. And luckily, we have um, uh, among the crew of that expedition, a famous Russian writer, Ivan Gancharov, mm -hmm. who happened to write a book about it, a travelogue. Uh, and it is titled The Frigate Pallada uh, after uh, the expedition's flagship. Okay. So, um, uh, and it also describes actually the uh, Gancharov's overland journey through Siberia back to European Russia. Mm -hmm. So um, I take this um, mid 19th century Russian travelogue um, and probe it for insights about Russia's imperial identity, mm -hmm. but also use it as a lens onto mid 19th century global colonial history. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just a book about Russians, but about Russians on a global stage. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, Readers of my book will get snapshots of Cape Town, of Singapore, of Hong Kong, of Shanghai, of Nagasaki, and also Irkutsk, which was the capital of Russian Siberia at the time. Oh, okay, uh, fascinating. So a couple of questions. One off the bat is what led you to write the book? Did you come across um, Goncharov's um, Chronicle and you got interested <laughs> that way? What was the impetus? So I actually stumbled upon this project. Uh -huh. um, I uh, read one day Gancharov's biography, and I, I found out that he made this incredible voyage, and then he wrote a travelogue about it. Um, and I figured, given the locations uh, where the voyage took him, mm -hmm. surely he'll have something to say about the kind of imperial questions that I was very interested in pursuing. Mm -hmm. Um, that said, I didn't plan to make it into a book. It was supposed to be a chapter in my other bigger project mm -hmm. called The M Empire in the Russian Classics. But as I kept working on it and, and, and digging in all those issues, it, it sort of new nodes kept proliferating in all directions. Mm -hmm. And to really uh, attend to them was no longer possible within the confines of a single chapter. Right. So I decided to make a separate book about it. Okay, so, and how, other than reading the book, did you do um, additional research around it? Um, I wish I had a more colorful answer to that question, mm -hmm. but it actually, uh, writing this book meant going to the library a lot and reading lots of books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
I was uh, spending a fellowship year at the time at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, which is uh, you know, as close to uh, scholars paradise as you can possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. And I had a chance to speak with a lot of scholars who knew the histories of the various places that I needed to write about. And they helped me with by suggesting books and other reading material. So um, now thinking back, um, I really, really wish that, um, you know, that I had written an amazing uh, grant proposal that would justify my travels right. to all those sure. fabulous places. Uh, so I guess that would have meant um, postponing the project, which, but I didn't really, really didn't want to do this. Um, at the same time, the books of the various scholars um, uh, I've read, historians of uh, Britain, of uh, South Africa, of China, of Japan, of Siberia, uh, did give me amazing armchair sure. <laughs> journeys at the least. Okay. That said, I, um, I have a lot of ideas about potential vacation locations, <laughs> uh, which is all the, you know, all the, more, all the nicer in that uh, I actually do know now a little bit about the histories of sure. those places, yeah, that's if I ever excellent. go there. Right. Yeah. How long was the, his voyage? Uh, they set out in uh, the fall of 1852, and then, um, they arrived in Japan um, early 1853. Um, it's a little complicated, but um, at a certain point, actually, the tsunami destroyed the Russian ship. Oh, my goodness. So there's, there's a lot of uh, dramatic turns uh, okay. in the book. But um, the mission itself uh, continued until 1853. Then the Russians sent a new, fr new frigate, and um, the, the diplomacy and negotiations with Japan continued until <clears throat> 1850. Five, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, Gancharov, my writer, did not stick around um, f to see that happen because he was getting a little tired of, of traveling and his wanderlust was sated, so he decided to return overland mm -hmm. um, uh, back to Russia, which is why he took that very, very arduous uh, journey across Siberia. He actually called it that, he said that no drama and storms on the high he sees uh, matched the sort of um, adversities of, of uh, handling Siberian rivers and Siberian mountains and, all, and Siberian muds, you know, swamps. Well, so. I would imagine the cold, too, was particularly the cold troublesome. Too. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, any surprises while you're, you know, reading the book, something that you didn't perhaps expect? Yeah. Um, I guess um, I didn't surprise, uh, I, I didn't expect to see, to open this mid 19th century Russian book and to basically see a vision of the world that I know so well from my life now. Um, and this is also something uh, that uh, was actually the biggest surprise for Gancharov, my author. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is that um, uh, the degree to, to which the world uh, of 1850s uh, imperial frontiers was interrelated. Mm -hmm. uh, the sort of accelerating forces of globalization that he came to observe in these various uh, ports of call mm -hmm. was really something that struck him. And he, he, he was a very keen observer of, um, uh, of that new kind of glo more globalized world coming into being. So um, I guess what has surprised me is also the same thing that surprised uh, him. And interestingly, um, there is a very uh, excellent uh, recent biography by Joseph, Con Joseph Conrad, mm -hmm. uh, by Maya Yasanov, which uh, stresses Conrad's prescience in, in foreseeing the forces of globalization. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the end of the 19th century. But here, with Gancharov and the frigate Palada, I have uh, you know, a writer and a book that beats Conrad to it by half a century. Right. So that was truly, mm -hmm. truly amazing for me to learn. So what are some of your insights about what uh, Goncharov writes about Russia's foray into globalization? This book is a very rich uh, document of Russia's imperial worldview in the 19th century that resonated very broadly with uh, the Russian publics. Uh, this book presented very powerful arguments that Russia must get more engaged uh, in uh, imperial expansion and colonial activity, in securing new markets, in getting more active in international trade. 
um, in, um, so so uh, in that sense, it was a sort of a, a, an argument for Russia stepping more decisively into the global arena, well peopled by representative of all these other empires. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that is the message that Gancharov presented uh, exceedingly well. Um, other ways in which this book resonated very well with Russian readers is that it combined very nicely um, a sense that Gancharov was, was a self-confident European mm -hmm. on all these imperial frontiers, but at the same time viewed these worlds through a distinctively Russian lens. Okay. So um, that a lot of reviewers uh, commented on that, on, on that very special um, quality of the book. So, um, so yes, these are some of the, uh, some of the highlights for okay. the readers uh, uh, in Russia at the time of this particular book. But the important thing to remember about it is that it wasn't a sort of just a, a description of places. It was really a book with arguments, okay. uh, right, about um, uh, Russia becoming more competitive in uh, imperial enterprises and sort of catching up with, um, with other empires who were, who were uh, uh, present and active in uh, imp imperial frontiers in Asia and Africa. Sure, sure. So let's talk about travel logs and and um, were they very popular at this time and and how was the frigate Palata received in Russia? Mm -hmm. uh, travel logs were incredibly popular in the 19th century. Um, so, um, you know, travel writing of explorers such as um, Stanley Livingston uh, were uh, some of the biggest bestsellers of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Twain is actually uh, better known, well, was better known in the 19th century to American readers as an author of travel, uh, as the author of travel books, sure. not of a novelist. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, uh, public collection for the monument of, Ni uh, of um, Nikolai Przewalski, a, a famous Russian explorer of, of Central Asia, mm -hmm. uh, actually rivaled uh, the contributions um, that were given to the monument of Russia's national poet, mm -hmm. Alexander Pushkin. So uh, excerpts from travel books were everywhere, in journals, in, in newspapers. Um, it was everyone's favorite reading because um, travel books really combined in a very attractive whole colorful information and useful information about the world, mm -hmm. but also colorful narrative right. about it, right? So you had a little bit of adventure uh, and some, uh, you know, lyrical descriptions of sunsets mm -hmm. and some colorful, um, you know, episodes about interactions with uh, the, the local people, um, often imbued with humor. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you got your basic information about the history, politics, culture, um, uh, culture economy, anthropology, ethnography of various, uh, of these various um, uh, new places. Uh, and if you were Charles Darwin, lots of natural history, right? right? right. So um, it was a sort of, in, in one Hill, you would get all these different um, um, types of sure. content. So, um, so that's why um, these books were so popular. And Gancharov's uh, travelogue is no exception. Okay. Uh, it was actually an imperial era bestseller. Mm -hmm. uh, even, even though he's best known as a novelist in Russia, this book outsold any of the novels mm -hmm. that he wrote. Um, it was incredibly popular. It was read by um, young adult readers and women and government officials. It was um, uh, part of military academies uh, curricula and also taught in regular schools. Mm -hmm. The government actually promoted it as, as the model for all uh, travel writing, oh, wow. um, at least for people that it employed to write. Sure. Um, so, um, so this is really uh, a book that, um, you know, if you're interested in connections between uh, literature and society, this is a book for you. Mm -hmm. And what do you conclude in your book and what would you like people to take away from it? If it's just one thing, what would yes. you like them to take uh, away? Let's see. Um, well, uh, if we think of uh, modern imperial uh, modern European imperialism, what comes to mind? 
Well, it might be Britain and its Indian colonies, mm -hmm. or French uh, and Algeria, or maybe the Spanish colonies in South uh, America, right? Russia typically would not come up in this lineup. Right. So my one takeaway from Eidos, the thing that I really hope uh, they take from this book is that um, Russia should be part of this story. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is uh, a country that um, in its guise as a modern empire was second in size only to the British. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is as a result of the imperial processes that it, continu that it, it is at this point the biggest country on earth. Mm -hmm. So um, what I'm hoping is that um, when we think of European uh, imperialism and colonialism, Russia will become uh, part of this history and part of this story. Uh, and I would also hope that uh, reading my book, um, um, readers might, would actually think that it would be, it is fascinating to in actually think of Russia and to study Russia um, in, in this aspect. Mm -hmm. Okay, this has been uh, very interesting. Thank you for being here with us today and sharing your work. Thank you. For more information about Professor Bolyanowska and her research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.